At the edge of the Arctic Circle, the fearless have arrived. Drawn to the thrill of a new challenge. A passion to combat the extreme drives them onwards. In this land of raw, glacial power, only the greatest warriors will reach their peak. The mountain awakens. The stage is set. Goddess of fucking cold. Welcome to Motor Store. As 2008 closed, Pacific Rift had proven a critical and commercial success for the PS3. The games, and the brand as it were, were holding well against the other racing games and it had its own little space. However, whilst MotorStorm was two entries strong, it was still only attached to one console. And as the PlayStation Portable had shown, just because its system was smaller and in turn less powerful, did not mean it couldn't keep up. Between Liberty and Vice City Stories or Little Big Planet, there are all manner of console quality games impressively delivered on this system. The PSP has some great ports of home console games too, like the greatest hits approach to Burnout Legends or the nightlife majesty of Midnight Club LA Remix. Paired with their home console counterparts, these are stellar examples of how ports can be done well. But of course, it's not just ports, the system has a fair share of its own racing games too. Wipeout Pure, Burnout Dominator, Flat Out Head On, Ridge Races, there's just so many excellent racing games made for the PSP. I mean, for fuck's sake, they managed to get Test Drive Unlimited running on this fucking thing, so anything's possible. Racing game royalty in the form of Gran Turismo had the simulation feel covered, but there always needs to be a yin to the yang. Evo were a bit busy, so a new sheriff strode into town by way of Big Big Studios. A studio that's a subsidiary of Evolution Studios, isn't it? Huh. And well, they're an excellent choice, really. Their Pursuit Force games were a fun time. They understood the PSP's hardware, and well, yes, they were a subsidiary of Evo. Trying to recreate another developer's previous experience is not going to be an easy task, but considering the relationship between the two developers, it really makes it seem quite easy. It's a killer series. It's a killer dev. I suppose it could be a killer game as well. So there was no way this could be a port of the original game, let alone a port of its sequel. A brand new experience then, an experience that had to stand alone when compared to its predecessors, and not just because of the hardware it was running on. Fortunately enough, Motorstorm is a very creative series in terms of its aesthetics and design, and one aspect that immediately sets a Motorstorm game apart in both regards, is its setting. Torn up the desert, destroyed the jungle, now it's time to break through the tundra. The frontier was cold at night but blistering in the day, the Iowa sea breeze paired with its tropical sun, but this frozen domain offers no such solace, no such forgiveness. This is Antarctica, a vicious plain defined by the most aggressive of snowdrifts and pure uncomforts. Its stark beauty, its low temperatures define it as one of the world's most treacherous beauties. As the sand once turned to sea, the sea becomes the snow. This place can never be tamed. And then again, perhaps that isn't the point. Instead, it can be enjoyed. The festival has returned, and with it, the storm of engines, old and new. Metal monsters, only capable of violence. Motorstorm, Arctic Edge. Or as it's known in Japan, Motorstorm, Raging Ice! Woo, Motorstorm's back, baby! Yeah, yeah, it's Motorstorm, eight classes, it's all good shit, I know. Eight classes, six of which are returning, two are brand new. Between all those, there are about 24 sub-choices in total. That's quite a good number. There are bikes. ATVs, buggies, rally cars, snow pluggers, big rigs, and the two new favorites, 
snow machines and snow cats. Racing trucks have been given the boot and mud pluggers have creatively been renamed to snow pluggers. It's incredible how one word makes all the di not really. The game's newest additions, the snow machines and the snow cats, are purposefully intertwined with the game's setting. It's a good roster, but I want to pay my respects to the weakest class first. Bikes are back to being shit. After the redemption arc of Pacific Rift, I thought the bikes were on a good track, but no. The bikes don't feel like they have any surface in mind. They're constantly sliding all over the fucking place. And with the new ice all over the map, I mean, fuck, it's, it's ridiculous. The bikes are reasonably fast, but they can't weave too well between the other vehicles, so it doesn't really matter. They seem to get effortlessly pushed around by all the other class. Wait a minute, I could just reuse my notes from the first game. ATVs are another one that have seemed to have let me down. They're just too slow. I mean, they really, really seem to struggle uphill, and it just makes it a little bit too difficult to use this class consistently. The turn in circle isn't too bad. The vehicles do have a certain amount of traction on the track, and they do handle reasonably well, but they're just too slippery. They're not as bad as the bikes, but like I said, still too slippery. It's a shame. ATVs used to be real reliable, but now they're just a bit uneasy. Despite the disappointment of the previously mentioned, I'm happy to say buggies have stepped in to do the heavy lifting. The steering is surprisingly tight and the grip is consistently good. I feel quite confident in saying I don't think the class has ever been better and as a result it's just a lot of fun to ride these around. I think the buggies have finally found their place in this game as being a true all-rounder and to be perfectly honest that's what they should have been in the other games anyway. But, I'm not taking away from the achievement. Buggies, pretty fucking good. Nice. Rally cars are still an all-rounder, but unfortunately they feel a little bit worse. The biggest strength is the speed. It's the second fastest vehicle class in the game, being able to keep up with the bikes, whilst maintaining the control that the bikes simply don't have. Unfortunately, the rally cars are a bit of a princess when it comes to any of the game's surfaces. It's certainly an effective class. Unfortunately, I find it's a bit too unruly to really be all that reliable. But I don't fucking care because I can look like the V8 Interceptor. Oh, fuck yeah. Despite the uh, creative name change, snow pluggers are really a tracing back of the class's roots. Whilst being somewhat slow and considerably heavy or sluggish it's a very controllable class and probably the most controllable of all the classes really they're not just stranded behind the pack either because they can dish out the hurt well enough anyway not to say that they are the best class in the game but i would certainly say they're the best middle ground the snow pluggers are strong and effective effective enough that they can usually win the races there's a good case to be made that this is return of the champ ah big rigs the over-the-road racing classic is back, and it's pissed. Ugh, these things are just meaner than ever. I feel like they've been juicing between the games. They are not all that fast. In fact, they're incredibly heavy. Not so much like a brick, more like, like a bowling ball, really. On a track made of ice, I mean, I think that, I think that kind of explains itself. That's not to say the turn circle is bad or anything, it's just a bit, well, it's not meant to be easy to control. Whilst the acceleration is intensely slow, it's always a fun class to play. The first of two new, the snow machines, line up somewhere between the bikes and the ATVs. They are quick, small, and unfortunately exposed. And I would certainly say that this class combines the best and worst of the bikes and ATVs. Nevertheless, I would say this class is actually very interesting to play, and the handling is very fun. The snow machines have treads as opposed to wheels, so they can turn on the dime, but realistically they're quite slow. And that's the biggest advantage the snow machines have over the other smaller classes. It's the control. They control really well. I definitely enjoyed this class, but there are definitely better choices overall. Though, it's probably the best 
of the two smaller classes, so I guess that's got it gone for it. Yeah. No, seriously, they're pretty cool. Second newest edition, and with the snow cats, I've saved the best until last. Like a murderous Mr. Plow. This class resembles that of a frosty alternative to the monster trucks. However, I find that the snow cats are much more fun to use and intuitively designed. The biggest advantage over the MTs is just the reliability. No unnecessary spinning out, the class actually seems to be able to handle the terrain it's given. The monster trucks are gone, and I don't miss them. The Snowcat's biggest issue is that the class is too slow. However, because of the double treaded design, it has excellent torque and a solid turning circle to boot. Capable of making last minute adjustments, not that it needs to because it could just plow through everyone really. I mean, they really don't stand a chance. Yeah, it's not always a contender, but it doesn't matter because it's always fun. It slips around like, like an angry piece of, of, of butter. And yeah, for reminding me of the Simpsons Head and Run, it's my favorite of the game's vehicle selection. As a broad vehicle overview, I'll say that the roster seems pretty strong to me, though there do seem to be a few problems that have been reintroduced. By the developer's own account, the game's physics engine was imported from the original game. Borrowing code from the PS3 version, looking at it and going, oh my god, that's not going to run on the PS3. I'm not accusing them of lying or anything. I mean, I'm not a fucking idiot. Well, I'm not accusing them of lying, but there's something definitely a bit weird about this game's handling model, especially compared to the first and second game. By far and away the biggest difference between the other two games is that this game has much more of an arcade handling model. And as bizarre as it is, I'm going to assume mainly it's down to technical limitations, I think it's perfectly alright. The vehicles definitely feel a lot less bouncy than they did before, but that does mean that they have a lot more torque, and as a result, they just feel a little bit more easy to control. Yeah, sure, maybe it removes a little bit of the more unpredictable nature to the vehicles that made them fun to play around with, but as an experience, it feels a lot more precise. I certainly don't think the vehicles feel faster, but the turning circle definitely feels stronger. Like, the vehicles almost have more control, just in general. The bikes might slide around like dogs on a laminated floor, but the rest of the classes seem to have done quite well in this regard. I think all this makes the game feel easier, honestly. And this might be a guess, but who knows? Maybe they tweaked it because the analog stick on the PSP was just a bit... shit. The game's handling model isn't significantly different or anything like that, it's just when put side by side there are noticeable differences. It's still very much Motorstorm and I think it delivers the experience quite well. Terrain differences are very much key here, and some vehicles certainly do better on the snow. There's a very well hidden hint in the vehicle's names. I, I can't see it personally. There are less races this time around, and I think the track length accommodates this quite well by making them shorter. Drifting seems to be back, uh, kind of, and I appreciate it quite a lot, but there are definitely these other quirks that come along with this game's handling model. When two different classes crash into each other, one gets completely totaled, and the other just drives away undamaged. It's very strange. And speaking of crashes, vehicles seem to struggle crashing. Like, instead of actually normally crashing, they just sort of aimlessly list for the wind, like a plastic bag for the rainy streets of downtown Glasgow. And much like the rainy streets of downtown Glasgow, it's a rather dull affair to begin with. Another strange design decision that seemed to work in the other games but doesn't here is the sub choices and their performance differences. In Pacific Rift for example, despite the fact that the rally car had numerous different sub choices, they all more or less handled in terms of performance exactly the same. But here they have specific differences. Differences that can be seen on this sort of stat sheet. It removes some of the player expression because some of these vehicle choices get rendered obsolete through some of the unlocks. Bizarrely enough, I don't think Motorstorm's biggest differences in terms of its vehicles come from its stats. I think it comes from the classes themselves. There's eight of them. There doesn't need to be this specific stat sheet bullshit. Like, it just, it just doesn't really work. I don't think it's terrible or anything, but sometimes it's better to leave well enough alone. Something else rather noticeable is the boost feels a bit weak in this game. The boost seems to take too long to kick in. Now this has slightly been accommodated for because it seems like there is more boost in the tank, but it's too long. 
No, too slow. The three smallest vehicles can still commit drive-bys. They're not as good, they're slightly harder to aim than they were before, and, well, unfortunately, the ramming has been removed. It's understandable, really, as well. This is a game where the camera has to be aimed with the directional pad, because the right analog stick, there is no right analog stick. Despite what's missing though, I think the team has gone above and beyond in creating very customizable and fun looking vehicles. Vehicle designs have always been a strong suit of this series, and there are a few that have returned, but many are original. And the best part of all of these is that they now have original customizable parts, as well as interesting paint jobs. This is the most customizable any of the vehicles have ever been in Motorstorm. When referring to gameplay though, I think the progression used to unlock a lot of these things is excellent. Like it feels really meaningful and it feels like I'm always unlocking things and I'm unlocking a large variety of things. It's a fulfilling experience and I think the vehicles really benefit from that. Like the last games, vehicle classes are quite unbalanced, but also like the last games, they work very well against each other. And that's the nature of Motorstorm. Intense scrambles. Motorstorm isn't fun when all the other vehicles are a minute behind. It's fun when it's a desperate cling to first place. And I think that aforementioned nature is definitely intact, for sure. It's just with more of an arcade feel, and that's perfectly alright. Unfortunately, I just can't help but feel like something's been a little bit lost in translation. It's not terribly noticeable, and it certainly doesn't detract from the experience or hamper it all that much. But a space is a space. Still, the vehicles are a lot of fun, and at the end of the day, that's all it really comes down to. The modes of Arctic Edge, or Raging Ice, are largely the same with a few additions and omissions. Races are pretty much the same as they've always been. Something something, flagship mode, something something, fine. I'm too hungover to be even remotely creative when it comes to talking about races, so I'll just talk about the other modes. Unfortunately, Eliminator has gone, but in its place is a new mode called Time Ticker. It's a bit weird. Points are gained by staying the lead. I don't know, I never really got a groove for it, really. It's called Time Ticker, but it felt like a bit of a time waste. Fucking right. They should have just brought Eliminator back. I would have been happy to see Eliminator back. A similar event to the speed events seen in Pacific Rift are here, and they range from being really fucking easy or surprisingly hard. There doesn't seem to be a lot of in between. I, I don't really enjoy these either. The festival mode though has a new type of sub race. These invitationals, usually they're free races put into, yeah, an invitational. But it looks more like a championship. They're usually done to unlock some of the later vehicles and I found them quite enjoyable. They don't change up the game in all that big way, but it's enough. The PSP has ad hoc multiplayer, whilst the PS2 has split screen. Uh, time attack is here once again. Get to the good shit. Show me the good. Motorstorm Arctic Edge or Raging Ice has a number of tracks that I find particularly interesting. The setting hasn't slowed the team down one bit, as tracks look and feel distinct. Honestly, more so than the first game. Pacific Rift separated its tracks into four separate zones, and Arctic Edge or Raging Ice I, I, I gotta stop doing that. It separated itself into three zones. Low, mid, and high altitude are the three unique zones that separate Arctic Edge's tracks from each other. The game has 12 unique tracks in total. Gold Rush, Logjam, Mudball, Widowmaker, Eagle Falls, Wolfpack Mountain, Ascension, and Gouda Glacier, The Chasm, Northern Face, Snow God Canyon, and Vertigo. Whilst the roster of tracks in this game might not nearly be as wide as Pacific Rift, I think all of the tracks have been made in a particular way that makes them feel different from each other. In turn, that number isn't an issue, and these tracks show themselves up very well. Due to the portable nature of the game also, the tracks are usually fairly short, but after the first game, this is fine. The game really makes a good use of its setting. Underground caverns, snow-covered ice shelves, rocky mountain peaks. There's a consistency and even a playfulness to these tracks that I think really does great justice to Antarctica. There's a great level of verticality and tracks rarely flatten out. 
this verticality keeps the tracks interesting and unpredictable. This ties into another aspect, which is the scale. Whether it's a mountain climb or a narrow passageway, this game does it all well and it understands the setting. Like how seamlessly the ground gives way to those aforementioned caverns. It's just really fun to play around with. There are man-made elements everywhere that really help to distinguish the tracks and add more variety to the gameplay. Hastily built scaffolding on the edges of cliffs or the series signature big ass ramps. It's all really well connected. Surface differences are present, but the layout is patchy. It's difficult to navigate in a way the game's handling model can actually account for. The surface differences are more pronounced in Arctic Edge than in Pacific Rift, but it just gets a little bit absurd. Vehicles grind to a halt in a very unnatural way. It's not all that bad, but it does make the game feel a little bit more tedious than I'd like. After all, service differences are always relevant in any Moldestone game, but here they don't feel as nuanced or, well, clever as I'd expect. Despite that small issue though, tracks weave and cross over really well. The game's tracks are fairly linear, but it never feels like it. It's just really impressive level design. Like sure, there's an occasional layout confusion, I just can't tell where I need to go, but this is very rare, and mainly down to me being an idiot. Big Big have also done a great job of making the tracks feel more dynamic than they probably ever have before. There's nothing inherently wrong with static tracks. It's an issue though when it becomes noticeable just how static they are. Thankfully, there are several new inclusions to the game's sandbox to make it feel much more chaotic. The smallest of these mechanics is the ice bridges, and they're quite neat. Smaller vehicles can use them like any other aspect of the track, but bigger vehicles will destroy them. Ice bridges never change the track too drastically, but they are interesting because for once, the big vehicles are punished. And usually, as is the case with the last two entries, the bigger vehicles usually open up new routes and usually don't destroy them. The biggest new addition to the game's sandbox, at least mechanically, is its so-called Danger zones have to be done. These can be rock slides in a few specific instances, but for the most part, this applies to the game's avalanches. And oh, if there was ever a firm reminder of just how dangerous this landscape is and why it shouldn't be fucked with, well, here it is. Having the capacity to wipe out a full roster of races all in one go, oh, that's pretty fucking effective. I do love these, but there is one small issue. It just feels like whoever is behind is the one to be beaten over the head with the shit stick, and this just furthers the distance between first and last. It's certainly a fun mechanic, and I never got tired of looking at it or even playing it, but it's very unbalanced really. Despite the little issues, I do love these mechanics, but they're not even my favorite dynamic mechanic. In fact, my favorite uh, dynamic mechanic is probably one that doesn't move at all. Bob's sleigh pipes are fucking great. The steering locks up and the vehicles can't be controlled. No class is safe as this drunken fight for survival vacillates between tense and funny. It's strange to think my favorite mechanic in a racing game would be a lack of control of all things, but here it is. Bob sleigh pipes really do show off the best aspects of this game's level design, and I think they're an excellent inclusion to Moldestorm Sandbox. This game really doesn't have any bad tracks, but as far as a favorite, that would easily have to be Vertigo. It perfectly conveys the setting, and all the mechanics combine really well. Harsh weather, tough climbs, unpredictable terrain. It's got it all. There are proper battles between the classes, and now I really do think this is the true peak of this game's sandbox. Difficult to master, but always fun to play. It's what Moldestorm is all about. Tracks are something that need to be good in any racing game, and they excel here. Wide or thin, dense or simple. No matter the shape and size, the tracks are always their own, and a perfect example of quality of a quantity. I've been too positive, so now it's time to talk some shit. The two biggest issues with the game is one, it feels too restrained, and two, it doesn't feel as polished as it should. I'll start with the second because it's easier to summarize. The game hitches fairly often, but then again, the PS3 is the king of screen tearing. So that's not too bad, but the game has a fair few bugs. Like there is just this one spot where the AI just collectively loses the world to live. 
baby come back. This stuff isn't too bad though, it's mainly just funny. As for restraint, well that's a little bit more difficult to explain. I would say variety in general is slightly less than it was in Pacific Rift. This specifically applies to the biggest parts of the game, the tracks and the vehicles. However, considering the portable nature of the game, I wouldn't say it's all that bad. No, when I talk about restraint, I'm specifically talking about problems that were in the other games. These are problems that Big Big had the opportunity to fix, and they didn't. The way the AI in the later races slingshots through the inside line with absurd speed directly into a wall stops being funny pretty quick because this game's rubber banding is crazy. I'm perfectly alright with a game's difficulty ramping throughout the stages, but this isn't a ramp, it's a wall, and it's no coincidence that it appears right as this game begins to repeat itself. It's a shame that Pacific Rift's biggest problem was its rubber banding, and it's here. Possibly even worse. Motorstorm is such a fun and creative setup. Despite that, whoever the developer is, be it Evo or Big Big, they feel the best way to increase the difficulty is just to make the AI effectively cheat against the player. It's especially sad because the challenges in the races could have been a really good way to combat that difficulty. But no, they didn't do that. Overall, though, the game's problems aren't that bad. Dios mio, it really makes the end game a slog. Not much to say about the audio. It's very simple, and the system's wide, but it's effective enough. Engines sound strong, and the storm of motors, as it were, also seem pretty good. It's fun. I do think the audio can sound a bit patchy though, and I'm not gonna lie, terrain sounds pretty fucking rough. I also think Boo should be a real ah. It's a serviceable enough soundscape. It's not bad, but they could have definitely done more with it. Although the audio is pretty average, the visuals really excel. The system's the limit, sure, but that hasn't slowed the team down one bit. This game is very visually strong and consistent. It's the old motor storm tradition. Matte, fairly natural coloured environments, and incredibly colourful, bright vehicles. All of that's intact, with some interesting new impressions too. If motor storm's visuals are defined by naturalism, and Pacific Rift's visuals are defined by detail, Arctic Edge's visuals are defined by its usage of colour. It's easily the best use of said colour in the whole series. It's like a playable Joseph's Technicolor dream coat. What? There's lots to appreciate. A giant neon sign that really plays up the scale of the tracks, or a snowboard on the side of a buggy that really plays up the setting. The dense blizzards give the game a tension and atmosphere that sets the game apart. Stuff like this really helps the game and keeps it grounded in a sense of its own reality, lest it become too ridiculous, of course. Effects really pop. Explosions literally pop. The standout is the snow. Rendered distances are short, so effects like fog are a necessity. Tracks look excellent, and honestly, it's aesthetic bliss. It really adds to a sense of visual strength. Helicopters and planes flying low make the game feel more dynamic and add an outside movement to the tracks. The tracks have so much personality and variety. The altitude differences are visualized really well and there's a clear, palpable understanding from the team that they clearly know what these maps should be. Now that's metal right there. This is to say nothing of the vehicles which are predictably excellent. There are plenty of new vehicle designs and plenty of returning favorites too. Another welcome new addition, vehicles are now customizable. Numerous parts to change out, as well as liveries and paints, stickers, and these simple changes add so much. It's by far and away the best customization of the series, and really they've innovated here in some beautiful ways. If I want to drive around in garish fucking eyesore, well, it's my prerogative. The system can't really handle detailed damage models, so the frames of vehicles just bend around. I don't mind at all, it, it, it's very funny. 
There's even a simple photo mode to unlock some cross-promotional 3Ds. There is so much wipeout shit in this game. Wish I could play as Sackboy. Visuals play to the strengths of the system. There's personality in the menus, in the races, and everywhere else. It's aesthetically very strong and overall very visually succinct. I mean shit, about the only thing I don't like about the visuals is the camera shakes way too much. Like in the avalanches, it just looks really unnatural and... Ugh, I shouldn't have had that last whiskey chaser. Spin-offs are a difficult business. Developers have to scramble making a worthy game and perhaps applying their own character in the process. Despite all the difficulties that can come along with that, I think Big Big Studios has done an immaculate job of delivering the Mulder Storm experience. I don't think it always goes as far as it could, but they put their own spin on the series, and it's absolutely worthy of the name. A third notch in this series gone and a gentle, well, not too gentle, reminder that when it comes down to action racing games, Mulder Storm is as heavy as it gets on any system, in any setting, aiming high. What of the storm? That distant howling wind. That mechanical frustration amidst its searing speed. The sharpened edges of this wicked cold expanse cut deep and stretched to the sky. A hardy challenge for treaded chariots, and hardly a score for this primeval titan. A most terrifying grandeur unmarked by the metal horde. As the ground violently shakes, it's as if the natural anger of this frozen frontier has manifested an avalanche. But alas, what if it was a different storm? A storm of metal, emerging once more from the blizzard. Wait, wait, I never did the music. No, I never... I should do it now? Okay, it's uh, more of the same, but maybe better. It's still a little tiresome in places, but it has its uh, moments, and Propane Nightmares by Pendulum and Cell Dweller is easily the most motor storm sounding song this series has ever had. The PlayStation Portable allows for a custom soundtrack, so for this, I tended to pick more sort of wintry feeling rock songs. If that makes any fucking sense. Blackout by the Scorpions has some really hard riffs that I think fit the momentum of Motorstorm quite well. And Snowblind by Black Sabbath, because I am absolutely sure this is a song about the cold and nothing else. All in all, the game's soundtrack is not too bad. I'm glad it's found its sound. Wait. Wait go back. No, go back. Was that... Oh no. No, no, no. It's too much. It's too heavy. Oh god. Oh god!
Reflect